So the passion and the glory, this is lesson number five, uh, the final lesson in the series. The title of this lesson is His Last Gift. His Last Gift. Let's start by reading out of Acts chapter, Acts chapter one. Uh, the first account uh, I composed, uh, Theophilus, uh, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts, uh, part rather, of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. So here, this first passage in, uh, in Acts chapter one, uh, Luke is summarizing the last exchange between the apostles and Jesus after his resurrection and just before his ascension into heaven. Uh, there were uh, 40 exciting days with Jesus appearing to many disciples, teaching and making final preparations before his departure. And so he instructed them concerning the kingdom and he told them not to begin their ministry in Jerusalem until they were baptized with, that's in verse five there, or received power from, that's verse eight, the Holy Spirit. Important to make that distinction. They were baptized with or received power from the Holy Spirit. So during his three years with them, Jesus had given them many precious gifts. For example, the words of the heavenly Father, to uh, enlighten them. He had given them the proof of his divinity in various miracles. We read about that in John 14, 11. Uh, in order to reassure them and build their faith. Um, he had given, of course, the sacrifice of his body and blood to pay for the debt of their sins and also the witness of his resurrection in order to confirm all of his promises, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. These were all, in a way, they were gifts that he had given to them. And so now, as he leaves them, he promises them one last gift, and that is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that would give them not only the ability to carry out their mission, but also to completely transform them into different, uh, into different people, new people. So before we can grasp the meaning of this gift, this last gift that we're talking about, we need to first understand what the Jews themselves believed concerning the Holy Spirit. Although it is never fully expressed as explicitly in the Old Testament as it is in the New, the Jews understood that God was one, but that there was diversity in the divine being. For example, Genesis begins with a reference to God and the Spirit of God, Genesis 1 verse 26. The reference to God here is in the plural, suggesting this diversity. And God's name is in the plural as well. With time and further revelation, the Jews understood that the Godhead manifested itself to man in different persons. For example, in Psalm 51 verses 11 to 13, let's read that. The psalmist writes, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. So by the time of David, approximately 1050 BC, the Jews grew to understand that the Holy Spirit was God, 
and part of the one God that they worshiped, but a separate being because uh, uh, David here speaks in those, uh, in those terms. In Isaiah 61 verse one, another example, he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. So with time, they were taught that it was the Holy Spirit that gave power to their prophets and leaders who did great miracles, who saved them from their enemies, who enabled them to prophesy about various things, including the Messiah uh, to come. Uh, Joel, another passage, familiar one. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. So still other prophets confirmed both ideas that the Holy Spirit was God and that the Holy Spirit gave power to men, but also declared that when the Messiah would come, it would be with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so some prophets began attaching the idea of the Holy Spirit with the Messiah uh, to come. So by the time of Jesus, the Jews anticipated that when the Messiah came, the Holy Spirit would be with the people in a mighty way. In other words, he would not only be with the prophets and the leaders, but he'd be with the entire nation. Now, when we um, look at Acts 2.38, for example, Peter's command, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we usually focus on the baptism part. You know, and we use that as a proof text that that baptism is the proper faith response to the preaching of the gospel, which is, which is correct. But if you're a Jew in the first century and you heard that sermon, it isn't the baptism part that would surprise you or that would be you know, new to you, the, you know, the idea of water purification or you, the use of water in purification was not a new idea to the Jews. I mean, John the Baptist even had brought about uh, this idea. No, 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 when, when, when Peter said that, he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that was the news. That was the, oh, oh, the Messiah has come. The promise of the prophets was, the promise of the prophets was not you'll be forgiven for your sins. The, prophets, the promise of the prophets was the spirit will not just be with the kings and the prophets and the judges. The Holy Spirit will be with everybody. Everybody will have it. The young, the old, the male, the female, everybody will have the spirit. That was the news. That was what Peter was announcing on Pentecost Sunday, what Joel was talking about here. So for the Jews of that time, the Savior would bring with him the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would empower the people to become a great and strong nation as it once was in the glory days of Solomon. Now, this was their misunderstanding. This is how they thought the Spirit would act with them. Uh, the Spirit would come, everyone would be strong, they'd be able to throw off the yoke of Roman uh, you know, uh, imperialism, They'd be a free nation. That's what the Spirit would do uh, for them. Uh, and that's not exactly what the Spirit did for them. Jesus you know, tried to explain that to them and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't understand. Uh, John the Baptist, along, uh, along comes the prophet, John the Baptist, who's very influential, and he points to, the, uh, to Jesus and he says to the people, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Again, confirming what the prophets had said. When the Messiah comes, boy, the Spirit's going to come with him. Okay. And then Jesus Christ himself, Jesus' appearance causes great excitement. John declares that he'll bring the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells the people that he is the one sent from God, the one that they're expecting. His miracles are further proof that what they were expecting was about to be realized. So the, you know, in their mind, the golden age where the spirit was to empower the entire nation seemed to be at hand, and it was. It was, but not in the way the people thought. Okay? So when we read the New Testament and what happened after Jesus returned to heaven, we learn that he did indeed send the spirit for two reasons. 
One, to empower the apostles and early disciples to do miracles in the establishment of the church of the first century. And two, to indwell every believer who obeyed the gospel. So we understand that Jesus did this and it fulfills scripture. However, both these things are different experiences. That's where a lot of the confusion comes in. We need to understand the difference between empower and indwell. When we speak, uh, you know, if you have family or friends uh, in, you know, in the charismatic movement or Pentecostal church, you know, that's just the thing that they don't always understand. So let's talk about empowerment. The Holy Spirit has always been the person in the Godhead that has worked in creation uh, and man to accomplish God's will. I want to read once again Isaiah 61. It says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. By the power of the Spirit, Isaiah the prophet spoke because he was empowered by the Spirit to speak. Okay. Second Peter 1, familiar passage again. Peter says, speaking of prophets, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. No one ever said, well, you know, today I'm going to talk about God, or today I'm going to make a prophecy about God. I think this is a good day to do that. You know, he said, no, no, no. Not by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. We could take that word moved and we put the word empower there and it would work in the same way. But men empowered by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. By the power of the Spirit, the prophets spoke from God. Uh, by the power of the Spirit, Jesus performed his miracles. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, Jesus said. And so Jesus promised his apostles that he would give them this same power from the Holy Spirit, the same power that worked for the prophets and the judges and the leaders and the kings, as well as for Jesus, would now work for them, the apostles. They would be empowered. Why? Well, first of all, to help them remember accurately all of his teachings, John 14, verse 26, he was to bring into their remembrance everything. I mean, I can't remember my sermon title from four weeks ago. You know, I mean, I gotta, <laughs> I've got to go back to the, to the archive. So can you imagine remembering all the teachings of Jesus <laughs> over a three-year period and having to you know, reteach them accurately, no mistakes, leaving nothing out. So Jesus, I, if it were me, calmed them down, <laughs> reassured them that by the power of the Spirit they would be able to do this. Also to preach the gospel with power, John 16, seven and eight. What does it mean to preach the gospel with power? Well, to preach it with authority. To preach it with the ability to convict or convince. To preach it without fear. You know, myself or Marty or any preacher getting up in this congregation, we have no fear of, of preaching the gospel. We know pretty much everybody in the, in the crowd, and we're, we're most, almost all people are Christians, everybody's rooting for you to do a good job and they're saying amen, it requires no quote courage to do that. But if you go to a, you know, if you're invited to go somewhere else where nobody's a Christian and it's a bit of a hostile crowd and they'll boo you or throw something at you if they don't, if they don't like what you're saying, well it might take a little courage to stand up and start preaching to that crowd. So he's saying, He'll preach with authority and conviction, without fear. Who will give you that power? Well, the Spirit will give you that power. Don't be afraid. And then, of course, to, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to do miracles. 
to empower them to do miracles in order to confirm their preaching. So he preaches the gospel, you know, back then, uh, uh, Peter will preach the gospel, yeah, so, uh, and he says, Jesus is the Son of God, and I actually saw him raised from the dead, and people are going, yeah, so? <laughs> and then the person who is there, who, is, uh, uh, who has been handicapped for life, you, know, uh, you pray over them and they're immediately healed. Okay, now, okay, maybe now we're paying attention. Now I got your attention, you know, and so, uh, they were uh, able to perform a variety of miracles to confirm that what they were saying was, ac was, was accurate, was from God. You know, speaking, uh, speaking in foreign tongues, Acts chapter two, verses 46, enabled them to preach to all creation. The healings in Acts three, verses one to 10, where Peter heals the lame man in the, in the name of Jesus. Raising the dead, Paul raises Eutychus, you know, a young guy who falls from the third story and, and dies one night and he goes down and raises him from the dead. How, how'd you like to confirm your sermon with, uh, and now I will raise somebody from the dead? You know, I think people will pay attention to your sermon. And also the ability to bestow on others the uh, ability to do these kinds of miraculous acts. They were only 12 men, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, they bestowed gifts on other disciples to help spread the gospel and build the church and confirm the truthfulness of God's, of God's word. So this kind of power was given by Christ through the Holy Spirit, but only to a few people and only for a short time and only for specific reasons, okay? As I mentioned, to confirm that the apostles and early disciples who preached the gospel were indeed telling the truth. If people doubted the messengers who spoke of a resurrected Jesus, they were reassured of their sincerity when they saw the miracle. I can believe what he says because I've seen what he can do. And then secondly, to help the early church establish and organize itself. Uh, there, were, there were no written records at that time of Jesus' life and his teachings in the early part of the first century. And so God provided the young church with people who had special powers and abilities in order to protect and guide the church until every member had access to the complete teachings of Christ. So by the end of the first century, the New Testament was pretty much accomplished and was being circulated in various forms. The death of the apostles ended the age where the Holy Spirit was given to empower people with miraculous abilities. Of course, this did not mean that he left people completely alone, which brings us to the second manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul talks about this, uh, uh, Paul talks about this idea of these gifts you know, receding with time in 1 Corinthians 13, right? When he talks about love, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, the ability to, to speak God's word, uh, through inspiration, they will be done away. If there are tongues, the ability to speak in a variety of human languages without having learned them, that miracle. He says, if there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, in other words, uh, knowledge that can only be gained through God's word, given directly by God. If there is this kind of knowledge, he says, it will be done away with, not the knowledge be done away with, but the way to receive that knowledge be done away with once we, once we receive all of the information that God wants to give to us. And then he goes on, for we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. And so there's a time for this empowerment phase, okay, where the Holy Spirit is directly empowering individuals to do things. Uh, the next thing that um, I want to talk about is the indwelling. Not everyone was to be miraculously empowered by the Holy Spirit. Only those that God had selected to carry out special ministries, you know, healings, tongues, prophecy. However, everyone could receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and this phenomenon was the true fulfillment of the prophecies about Him in the Old Testament. You see the confusion? 
Some thought, oh, the Messiah is going to bring the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to empower us. We're all going to be able to do you know, great things. We're, you know, we're going to do things like Jesus did, feed the 5,000, walk on water, oh boy, do healings. Well, if the entire nation is able to do that, we'll be able to get rid of Rome. It'll be back to the glory days. Yeah, so they, they had it right, but not quite. That power was going to be there, but only for certain people and for a particular reason and for, for a certain length of time. The indwelling, however, um, this was going to be for all time. So in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter offers this to all those who believe and respond to the gospel in repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38. Note that all who did this were promised the Holy Spirit, but none who were baptized on Pentecost Sunday did any miracles. Only apostles did these. And then later on, those upon whom they, the apostles, laid hands. I often ask my Pentecostal friends, uh, Peter promised them the Holy Spirit, right? Yes, okay. How many were baptized that day? Well, 3,000. How many of them demonstrated miraculous gifts on that day? Well, zero. <laughs> Don't you, doesn't that tell you something? <laughs> so when Peter says, you know, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's the indwelling, that's the promise of the indwelling. The Spirit indwells you. In Acts 8, 18, I don't want to confuse you now, but in Acts 8, 18, where um, uh, Luke writes, now when Simon, we know who Simon was, right? He was a magician, a sorcerer, magician, and he was converted to Christianity. And he was watching now Philip and the others, you know, uh, preaching, and, uh, and he notices that when the apostles laid hands on some of the individuals, they started to speak in tongues. And so this passage, Luke writes this passage. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying, ha uh, laying on of the hands of the apostles, he offered them money. In other words, he was watching and he sees that the apostles lay hands on certain disciples and those disciples begin speaking in miraculous tongues. He, he sees, oh, the, the Spirit has been, you know, these people have been empowered through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. He says, I want some of that. <laughs> I, I want some of that. And why wouldn't he want that? He, you know, the old ways, right? He was a magician his whole life, dealing in all that. And now he, he sees a, an actual true power taking place and he sees the way that it's been done. He wants to buy it. And we know the story, you know, the, the apostles denounce him and the, uh, he's afraid and he asks them to pray for him, but a good example of uh, the mindset of that time and the confusion between the two. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is God living within the heart of every believer, the actual presence of God within the individual in the person of the Holy Spirit. Does the Bible teach that? Because you know, even in the church there's, there's you know, different points of view. Some people think that this phenomenon here, this indwelling, uh, is, uh, hmm, uh, is merely the, the knowledge of God's word. In other words, uh, the Spirit gives us the word and the, the Spirit lives within us by the word being inside of us. You know, we, know, we memorize scripture, we understand God's word, that's how the Spirit uh, dwells within us. Uh, I don't particularly hold that uh, view. Uh, and one of the reasons I don't is I have trouble sustaining that kind of view based on this passage here. You know, Paul says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's not a metaphor. He's not using a metaphor here. He's saying through his spirit who dwells in you. So Paul does not explain the mechanics of how a divine being can inhabit a mortal body, only that it does. 
You know, faith is taking God at His word even when we do not understand how He has done certain things. What does the Hebrew writer tell us? By faith, you know, what is it? We understand the, the, world was made, the world that is seen is made for things unseen. How does that work? Can somebody give me an equation, a mathematical, a mathematical equation? Can somebody explain to me scientifically how God made the things that are seen from things that are unseen? Because that's the only explanation we get of, ex quote, how He had done things. Here, uh, there's the passage. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. <laughs> Okay, that's an explanation, <laughs> but you still require faith, right? In the end, faith will be rewarded in resurrection. And so the Spirit dwells in us. Another passage that, that confirms this concept, that the Spirit of God in a dynamic way dwells within us. Paul says, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So here Paul explains the same event, but he uses different imagery. The body is a temple, the Holy Spirit lives within the body. Now, just as the empowering of the Spirit had been given to specific people at a specific time, so was the indwelling of the Spirit given to specific people at a specific time. He was to indwell every person that believed in Jesus, repented of their sins, and was baptized, according to Acts 2.38. The Holy Spirit was offered to everyone, not just the apostles, not just to a few special disciples. This is how all nations would be blessed. The Holy Spirit would be available to all nations, not just the Jewish nation. Secondly, the people who received Him would not demonstrate miraculous powers, but that is not to say there would be no change in their lives on account of the Spirit's presence. One does not have to perform miracles to know that the Holy Spirit dwells in them. A believer can know this in other ways. And so the Holy Spirit within a Christian motivates him to seek and experience the things of Christ. How do I know the Holy Spirit is within me? Well, a couple of examples. One is prayer. He's our prayer partner, if you wish. He encourages us to pray with reassurance that our prayers will be heard. He moves us to pray and keeps our prayers before the throne of God. Romans 8.26, Paul says, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And so through our prior life, our desire for righteousness, our flesh or human nature has no interest in seeking righteousness for Christ's sake. This is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit leads us into the desire for good, gives us a thirst for God's righteousness and the kingdom's establishment. The, the Holy Spirit is behind every campaign to evangelize. Romans 8. So then, brethren, we're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The flesh never wants to go the second mile. <laughs> you know, flesh doesn't want to do that. The flesh never wants to resist a, a sexual temptation. The flesh uh, rarely misses an opportunity to lift self up. It's the Spirit within us that calls us to humble ourselves, to do what's right to go the second mile, to be pure because it's pleasing to God. That's the work of the Spirit. Another way that we know, intimacy with God, the desire and the ability to have intimacy with God. 
Without the Holy Spirit, we can know doctrine, but we cannot know God. I mean, when I was in college, well, yeah, in college in Montreal, uh, I, I was taking some classes at uh, Loyola, Catholic University there, um, and uh, uh, I was taking an Old Testament class, and it was a, um, uh, uh, the professor there was uh, you know, fluent in Hebrew, uh, just like Greek uh, professors in, in the New Testament. He would read the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, you know, and he would he'd be reading it in Hebrew and translating it as he spoke. This, is, this is, was his expertise. And so he could read the Old Testament in its original language and he was a, you know, a legit scholar. And yet when he spoke and, and the applications that he made, he, he was so worldly, <laughs> it's incredible. And he himself, you know, living with my girlfriend and you know, I'm going to go take a smoke break. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the separation was, was visible. I wasn't sitting there to judge him, but I was just thinking, wow, how can you be reading the Hebrew Old Testament in its original language and be such a worldly person? Well, I guess you can. Just like how many people know the Bible and know the stories in English and yet don't live a life of faith. And so the desire and the ability to have intimacy with God, that's the spirit that pushes us for that. The Holy Spirit acts as a facilitator between our spirit and the word of God to enable us to have a relationship with a being whose nature and scope, our own faculties weakened by sin, have a hard time relating to. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not know God. That's how he helps us. Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. All these terms, to be, to, you know, that Christ dwells in your heart, to be filled up with the fullness of God. What does that mean? That's, those are just ways of saying, you know, you will know God. You know, the, the, the term know in the Old Testament uh, they'll say, uh, yeah, and he knew her. When, when they say that, and he knew her, or he knew his wife, it doesn't like, hey, hi Josephine, I'm Joe, you know, shake, no, no. To, to, to know means intimacy, he was intimate with her. Well, that's what they're talking about here. You won't just know God, hi God, I'm Mike, you're God, okay, you're, you're all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, you know, not that kind of knowledge you will be intimate with God. That's what the Spirit enables us to do, that we can be intimate with Him. And being intimate with God is the first taste that we have of what heaven is like. Okay. And then of course, the Spirit helps us in our service in the kingdom. Um, Paul says in 1 uh, Corinthians, now there are a variety of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given uh, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one uh, Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually 
just as He wills. So in this passage, Paul talks about both the miraculous abilities available in the first century and other abilities which are still experienced in the church today. So in the New Testament, we learn that every believer receives the Holy Spirit and that He enables every believer to minister in some way. That's the point here of this passage. If one preaches, he does so by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit. If one sings or teaches or cleans or fixes or visits or organizes or gives, he or she does it through the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, I do not believe, however, that the Holy Spirit helps you to be a better teacher or a sweeper than someone who is not a Christian. I don't believe that. Being expert at something only comes by training, practice, and natural ability. I do believe, however, that the Holy Spirit gives a believer the strength and faith to sweep and serve and give for something he cannot see now, but will see in the future. That's how the Holy Spirit enables me to serve. The Holy Spirit helps us fix and serve and give for something they cannot, they can, excuse me, uh, people who do not possess, that's the point, people who do not possess the Holy Spirit, they fix, they serve, they give for something that they can see and touch and taste. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, helps the believer to continue to do the best he can for something not yet seen a promise not yet realized. I know the Holy Spirit is in me because I am spending my life serving a Lord I cannot see, ministering to a kingdom that I cannot touch. I've tried to explain who receives Jesus' last gift, the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in the heart of the believer, and what are some of the things the Holy Spirit does for the person He indwells. So that's you know, we tried to cover that. We only have about two or three minutes left. So I want to conclude by telling you that the offer of the Holy Spirit is still available. God no longer empowers us to do miracles today because we no longer need them to confirm or establish the church. We have His word that does that. We now have His complete word recorded to help us do this work. The sign that we are truly of God is not the power of miracles, but the power of love. By this all men will know that you're my disciples, Jesus says, in the way that you love one another. There's the sign of discipleship. He does offer forgiveness, however, because we're still sinners and need to be forgiven. And He offers His Holy Spirit to live within us because all of us, all of us, desperately need help in prayer, help in doing what is right, help in knowing God intimately, help in serving a God we cannot see, in a world, in a world that discourages us to do that. So, through the eyewitness records of Jesus' final days, I've tried in these last five sessions to share with you His passion and His glory. We've been in the private room and seen Him eat the final meal with the apostles. We have heard His final words while He hung on the cross. We were there to see and hear Him as He appeared to the apostles and others after His triumphal resurrection. And all of us know that His final command is that all the world is to believe and to be baptized or perish forever. And finally, we have received the offer of His final gift, the Holy Spirit living inside of every single person who will receive Christ through faith expressed in repentance and baptism. And so the passion of Christ on the cross was for your sins and my sins, and the glory of His resurrection can be the glory of our own resurrection as we continue in faith. All right, there's the series, The Passion and the Glory. I thank you very much for your attention. God bless you.